The latest cover of British Vogue features activists and impactful leaders like Dr. Bernice King, Jesse Williams, and Tamika Mallory. In this episode of Culture Conversations, we spoke to Tamika about some of the work she's doing in several communities and her never-ending fight for justice. We are in a state of emergency. Black people are dying in a state of emergency. I support uh, Tamika. She is a powerhouse and a force to be reckoned with. I've been wanting to talk to you for a really long time, so, um, but I really want to talk to you about all the protests and the recent uprisings that we've been seeing um, with all the traumatic incidents that led up to it from Ahmaud Arbery to George Floyd to Breonna Taylor. Um, can you talk a little bit about why we're seeing that right now? You know, I think you that we can't um, sort of discredit or ignore the role of COVID-19 in this moment um, and how people being sort of locked at home, under stay at home orders, um, and and also just under a great deal of despair and stress has created uh, what's, what some people call an arrest of the mind. Like we have been arrested in a lot of ways. And when, and, and being arrested is not always a bad thing. You know, of course we see it and and I and we 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 relate it to criminal justice and mass incarceration, but the word arrest in itself means to basically stop, slow down, be confined, be with oneself, right? And so um, we've been arrested for the last few months, and as we sit with ourselves, sit with our cell phones as the only form of communication that we have sometimes with the outside world, we are now able to see incidents and be more critical about it. In this moment, you had no choice but to sit down and actually review, understand, process the feelings, process the trauma, process the idea that a movement has been happening around these issues and I've been avoiding it, ignoring it or trying to challenge it, you know, disagreeing, saying, I don't believe that police are are that uh, brutal. I don't believe that white vigilantes are hunting and killing our people. And so they happen to see it for themselves. You actually watched these men hunt Ahmaud Arbery and shoot him down like a dog. You saw that happen on tape. You saw... George Floyd calling for his mother and his life leaving his body. And you know about, you may not have seen a video, but you know about Breonna Taylor being murdered in her home as a young EMT worker, a young woman. And so I think with, with, with us sitting still and having to sit with and examine what is happening in America, there were a lot of people who said, I'm already frustrated. I may have lost my job. Uh, you know, I may have been ignoring this, but I can't anymore. I got to deal with it. Do you really think that this time will be different? I think we already see it's different. You know, when I was looking at footage of the protesters in Portland who are up against literal terrorism, like there's literally terrorism happening in Portland where uh, today we're seeing a different narrative. We're seeing the wall of moms. We're seeing, you know, white women coming together to fight against uh, this task force that Trump sent in. But if we really sit back and remember how it all started, it started because people were protesting uh, in a Black Lives Matter movement and Trump sent in his task force or William Barr, whoever you want, they all the same. It's like one person up there. They all are the same. They sent in this division, this task force, these secret ops who were placed there to stop the Black Lives Matter protests. So, so if we understand that, right? And now you see white people, people of all different races, people of all different backgrounds, they don't have to do that. They could go home and say, it's too dangerous. I don't want to be out there, right? I don't even have that problem. So why the hell 
why go to himself out a crowd and allow a, a, an officer or this special force to come against me and potentially harm me? Why would I do that? Right. So to see people saying, no, this is what's right. You know, I'm, I'm going to move in a spirit of protection of black bodies. I'm going to put myself out there, even if I could be harmed. That in itself is showing that there is a change. There's a shift. It's happening right before our eyes. So there is a shift happening. And, but we have to understand that it's been over 400 years. Some people say closer to 500 years. We're not going to solve it in a little bit of time. It's going to be a long haul process to get where we're trying to go. You know, one thing I really want to talk to you about, too, is um, Breonna Taylor, because um, I know you've been an advocate for her since day one. I just can't see myself sitting back and, you know, being out there protesting, demanding justice for so many people down through the years and particularly so many black men who deserve justice, who we should be standing for and not going twice as hard for a young black woman, an EMT worker, a, a, an essential worker, a young lady who I have come to know her through her family, uh, her beautiful family. Breonna Taylor was a beautiful young woman. Mm -hmm. There has to be, there has to be accountability for mm -hmm. Breonna Taylor. There has to be. Um, and I think that we have the power to make it happen. Someone said to me the other day, well, you guys got arrested and they still didn't do anything. We know that. Mm -hmm. And we expect that. We understand that because guess what? Oppression is persistent. It's not like you, you press it once and it just crumbles. No, this thing is well resourced. It's well funded. It is, uh, it is the, the oldest behavioral or the the oldest attitude of America, right? Racism, oppression, like that's how this country was actually founded. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just buckle because people are showing resistance to it. It is a build-up process. Yeah. You have to make sure that it's clear that in every turn, we are prepared to sacrifice, to continue to prove, to show and to expose the injustice that's happening. 87 of us got arrested a few weeks ago. Well, we need 160, you know, mm -hmm. next time. Uh, because that's that's the pressure. The pressure is today, Breonna Taylor is not trending. We should find a way, mm -hmm. right? To, to just say, oh, wait, Breonna Taylor's not trending. Let's get to work. Mm -hmm. You know, let's figure out who do we need to who do we need to be talking to? Let me call Mimi, mm -hmm. and you know, let Mimi call three of her friends, mm -hmm. and let's keep it in the news because the only thing that these people respect is consistency and the same level of persistence that they have. So we're still in the process, but it's important because I think that as we have entered this new moment where there is a shift, that we have to be. We have to understand that now more than ever, we've got to be working with a strategy in mind, with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a goal for where it is that we're going. And also, we have to be able to identify what is the level of sacrifice that each of us is willing to make on the way. Now, with that being said, they charged you guys with felonies. Was that a scare tactic, you think? Well, you know, they did a lot more than charge us with that felony. Talk to me about that. The felony was the last part of it, um, which we didn't even find out why we were inside from the actual uh, uh, police or, you know, the city officials. We found out about the felonies while on the telephone, speaking to people, family members, friends, and otherwise outside. Mm -hmm. We never knew. But what they did was they gave us a felony that actually is used to protect domestic violence victims. Mm -hmm. So the, the felony is, uh, the charge is specifically intimidating a participant in a legal proceeding. So they tried to say that because we were sitting on his lawn, that on Daniel Cameron, the attorney general's lawn, mm -hmm. that we were intimidating a participant in a legal proceeding. Now. Here's my thing. Mm -hmm. Are you that fragile? Mm -hmm. Like, are you that weak 
that because people protest you as the attorney general of a state that you can't discern that regardless of whether they protest me or not, I'm going to do what's right. Like, what are we talking about? You know, I mean, so so there were people who sat in jail for a long time. It's called bullpen therapy. They try to break you down. They, mm-hmm. you know, make sure that the conditions are as bad as possible so that you, you know, wh- while you're going through the process, it, it is designed to break you, to make you feel uncomfortable. So they did all of that. And and that trauma was definitely on the hearts of many of the people who were there with us. Some of them were teachers. Some of them were uh, doctors. They flew in from other states. They did not, they, they didn't know what to expect. They knew it wasn't a pretty thing, but they didn't know that this this was the type of situation that they were going to have to deal with. And so they were very uncomfortable. They felt traumatized. Yeah. When they gave, when they gave us the felony, it reinvigorated everybody. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we showed where some other protesters the month before went to the governor's house. Yeah, I saw that. And hung an effigy, which is a, a dummy body, in in the governor's yard mm-hmm. with the governor's face on it. They lynched it to a tree. Not only did they, did they not receive a felony, they weren't even arrested at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Tamika, so many people consider you a leader, and I've heard you say that we are in a leaderful movement. What do you mean by that? I think there are many leaders. I mean, the young people that I have been meeting across this country over the last few months, you talk about leadership. No Justice, No Peace of Louisville. Those young people, the ones that walked out when the mayor was speaking, um, I don't know if you saw the mayor of Louisville was speaking and then all these young people came out with their signs and what have you, those are leaders. But these young people are super courageous. They are, they're smart. They're well read. Mm-hmm. Like when we were young, you might have read the, the autobiography of, of Malcolm X. Yeah. And you read the coldest winter ever, the Helen Keller book, right. and a few other things. And that, that was it. That was these it. kids are out here reading Michelle Alexander. Yes. They're yes. out here reading Tana yes. Coach, yes. Mark Lamont Hill. Like yes. these kids are these are yes. different kind of kids. <laughs> the Angela Davis. They can quote Audre, Audre Lorde. These kids are brilliant. Yeah. You know, this this is the kind of information yeah. that these kids are taking in. So I feel like for me, they are leaders also. It really bothers me when I hear people say there's no leaders. You know, there's nobody. Yes, there are. They're leaders for sure. They're everywhere. But the issue is we are so used to the one male charismatic leader at the helm of everything in business and in, in our households, which I, I do believe that, uh, you know, a, a strong black man being in his house, take care of his family and being at the head of his household is important. So I'm not speaking against that, but I'm just saying that our, 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 the ways in which we've been taught everything from Christianity on down, we believe in the one male charismatic leader and any other model seems it, it makes people feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. when in fact in this movement in this moment you've got men women uh trans folks you know people from the the, the entire lgbtqia community um you know younger people older people you've got a lot of folks who we can all benefit from following at different points in time. What legislatively would you like to see? Well, I certainly want to see uh, uh, defund the police become something that every single state and city and municipality picks up uh, because it does not mean getting doing away with police completely. I am an abolitionist in my heart. I believe that at some point we should be in a place where we don't need police officers in our community unless there is literally like, a, you know, a situation that we just can't handle. But I believe that every single thing that we are dealing with, from gun violence to uh, sexual assault to everything, can be addressed if we change our attitude and also allow the people 
who are experts from within the community to address the mental health crises, the drug abuse that our people are dealing with, the, the, tra the trauma, and legislatively, municipalities uh, across this nation have to look at ways to take resources away from militarized police forces on our streets and put those resources into the types of services that we deserve. Mm -hmm. I also think that Breonna Taylor's law should be everywhere, anywhere and everywhere across this country, that we should not have no knock warrants. Mm -hmm. If you are going to someone's home because there has been a crime committed or the suspicion of a crime committed, they still within their constitutional right should have the ability to know and surrender themselves properly without being shot to death. Talk to me about that speech you gave in Minneapolis. The one that you, it just seemed so impromptu, but it had so much power, so much pain. Where did that come from? It came from my angry black self. I was <laughs> pissed off. I had traveled by car from Kentucky, seeing Breonna Taylor's, the bullet holes in her window. I went from there to Indianapolis, where three people were killed by the police in 24 hours. One of them was a woman, a pregnant woman that a police officer killed with uh, his car. I, then I left there, going to George Floyd. The whole time we were driving 10 hours to uh, Minneapolis, the whole way through, the video was popping up on everybody's feed. And even though I wasn't watching it because I was driving at some point and I also don't like to watch those videos, I could hear the sound of somebody in distress and, and, and just listening to my partners in the car going, oh my God, oh my God, look at this. I can't take, you know, it's, it's trauma, it's emotional. So by the time I get there, they said, well, they, they arrest, they fired the cops. Fired? Like what? Somebody needs to be in jail. And, and, and I was just so, and then, and then I think what happened, Mimi, was that I was out there. I saw the whole thing unfolding right before they burned down AutoZone. You know, I was there, I saw, I saw the energy, the way the police officers were uh, antagonizing people, the tear gas, the rubber bullets, the whole thing. And we try to encourage folks and let them know that vandalizing property is not the answer that, mm -hmm. to getting the results that we're going for. But I understand it. Mm -hmm. I understand the level of frustration that people were feeling. So as I was arriving to get ready for this speech, because, you know, they had, they had, you know, they had uh, vandalized Target, all of this stuff was going on. And so as I'm getting there, I'm beginning to watch the media shift the conversation mm -hmm. from George Floyd to Target, you know, they lost this and the doors and, the, you know, and I'm like, yo, Target has insurance. They're going to be all right. What are we going to do about why folks was in the street in the first place? Like, let's go to the root of the problem and then back into the Target. I'll join you in our community to challenge people about Target, but I can't stand with you about Target if you're not with me about George Floyd. You know, so when I got up there to speak, I just was like, yo, it's a cesspool of nonsense. You have your organization, Until Freedom. For those who don't know, can you tell us what it's about and how can folks get involved? So Until Freedom is a social justice organization. We fight for disenfranchised people. And we focus mainly in the areas of criminal justice, um, gun violence, and women's issues. Um, and, and when I say women's issues, to be really, really specific, we look at how women are impacted by gun violence and criminal justice, and we are ignored yeah. oftentimes. Our stories don't make the, the, the national news. They certainly don't remain in the national, uh, and it, they don't, it doesn't remain a national story. Um, and so we... We, we, we specifically focus our attention on a Tatiana Jefferson, Sandra Bland, Shakisha Clemens, you know, Breonna Taylor, Rakia Boyd, the women who have also experienced state violence mm -hmm. and have not been protected. Um, and so Until Freedom is God's work. 
It's God's work. We have a, a, a deep love for black people. So even when we are, you know, saying it wrong or, you know, not, not necessarily getting it right, it's coming from a place of just trying to figure out what is best for black people. Get in touch with us by going to untilfreedom.com. Everything is there. No justice!